This is the Dawn of Everything Book Circle call for Thursday, April 28th. We're working on chapter two. Um, I know Judy, uh, Judy says she should be able to make the last half hour of the call, I think, or maybe half an hour. I'm not sure when, now that I think about it. Um, uh, I just put the link to uh, Google Docs uh, in the chat. So if you're, if you're so inclined, it would be awesome to, to have you typing along with me. We had an interesting conversation on Tuesday's call about just being in the moment and just talking without all the, the background overhead of, of notes and stuff. Um, so I, we didn't come up with, a, I, it's a conundrum, right? Um, it, it would be cool if everybody could kind of just be in the moment and, and conversation, but then you don't really save much. Conversely, you know, it'd be nice to save lots of stuff, but then you're not quite in the conversation as much. Um, where I ended up with that is I'm going to keep doing note, notes documents and, um, and maybe I've, I've liked, I liked sharing the notes document and screen sharing, um, but then it's distracting for enough people. I think I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to do that. And maybe next time I, what I thought was, was I would have the zoom call and then separately a VNC window sharing, um, the, the doc, the notes doc for people who wanted, who can stand the bandwidth of having both of those things up. Anyway, um, the other thing was I, we came up with a really good idea on the, on the Tuesday call. Uh, it wasn't mine. It was a couple of other people, um, coming into the call with, uh, kind of the thing that you want to talk about, um, about chapter two, um, is, is maybe a good way to kind of do check-ins and also a way to kind of get the, the topics into the, the room um, and then talk about chapter two. Um, chapter two primarily, and then maybe the book a little bit more at large and then stuff related to the book, you know. Um, it's, it's easy to, it's easy to kind of get off the track. And, and there were people who really wanted to be pretty close to the text uh, because it's a book club. Um, while at the same time also recognizing that I, I, we ended up deciding that, you know, you kind of want half and half. You want to do some pretty close reading of the text. And then you want to have maybe a rich kind of more bubbly conversation about what came up because of the, the text. Um, and with that, I think I'll get out of the way. So origins of inequality, Rousseau, right on. <laughs> <clears throat> Wicked liberty. Wicked liberty. Yeah, that's the a nice indigenous critique and the myth of progress. I love it. I love it. I like this chapter a lot. I actually, Pete. So I've been posting my little underlinings in mm -hmm. this wiki, which doesn't. But I think we should find a way to publish more of that to make it available. Because I've been. I took this from Klaus. The, a few weeks ago, when Klaus just said, "Here, this sentence." I forget the one there. This, and I'm like, yeah, I just read that. I just underlined that sentence this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> um, do you mean more than? So theoretically, well, uh, they're on a web page. Oh, where, 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 is that where is that located? Your your um, comment yeah, that wiki. <clears throat> the the wiki web page is at this URL. And then there's navig navigation links on the home page, but sometimes you have to click all pages and look for. Um, so there's a page. If you click all pages and then scroll down to reflections, underlined passages, WLA, that's Bill's underlinings. Yeah, I, didn't, uh, <clears throat> I should probably put them in the root. I mean, there's a whole, we have. Pete and I have some yeah. work, some wiki work to do, but I found it. <clears throat> but I've been just trying to. Uh... I also, just just throwing in here, um, if you if you're a Kindle person and you're highlighting, um, your highlights all pop up on read.amazon.com/notebook. Mm. I think I guess that kind of happens with Goodreads too. I don't use Goodreads. Mm. Anyway, sorry, Bill. No, no, I kind of. Anyway, I really like this chapter. 
It's a good chapter, yeah. And I think mostly because it really pokes that for me, they end with this little statement about, uh, let me think I can just get the last sentence because I underlined it. Um, it says, what if the sort of people we like to imagine as simple and innocent are free of rulers, governments, bureaucracies, not because they lack imagination, but, but because they're more imaginative than we are. And I just, for me, reading this book is, I try and read it that way about being stimulated by asking questions about what about, you know, things I, I think I really, I'm, I'm enjoying the way they just poke at that. So without you know, fact checking everything, I'm just, for me, that's a, a feeling I get from reading it, so. The, the, these underlinings are really, really good. Oh, I'm glad you've been doing that. Yeah, I, I kind of like the context, the contextualization of Rousseau's work. So explaining that discourse on the origin and foundation of inequality among mankind was written for, for an essay competition in France. It kind of I made know. me laugh. Yep, yep. And the fact that, as you as they rather brilliantly say, Rousseau was busy sleeping his way in, in, into influence. <laughs> I just thought that was very, very funny. Um, uh, but one of the things that kind of struck me, because I, uh, I'm a bit of a history nerd, and I've done a lot of study of what was going on in 17th century England, and also in the interaction between what was happening in England and what was happening in the North American colonies at the same time. And it kind of interests me that this chapter is all about stuff that was being debated in about 17, in the 1750s in France. Yeah. And I look at it and go, well, why have they picked debates going on in, 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 in the absolutist monarchy of France as a particular theme in the 1750s. Um, I mean, there's a, I like, but there's a section heading called in which we show how Europeans learn from Native Americans about the connection between reason, debate, personal freedoms, and the refusal of arbitrary power. So that's one of their big, big, big letter section headings towards the end of the chapter. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of look at it and go, yeah, but the kind of those issues were all worked out in real life in 17th century England during civil wars and leading up to the execution of a king having his head removed and January the 13th, 13th 30th, 1649, when they actually executed the king. They put the king on trial for three days and chopped the guy's head off. And I'm going, well, hey, an indigenous debate in 1750, yeah, but what about the fact that in England, they did that to the king in 1749? Mm -hmm. And also the, the kind of colonies that were founded in America were radically rethinking all these things in the 17th century. So you look at this thinking, well, hang on, looking at 1750 France is a bit kind of, you're a bit late here, guys, because all of this stuff has been worked out in a very powerful way amongst the English and their North American colonies a century before. Why are you not paying attention to that? Why are we talking about what was going on in 1750 France? Uh, it seems to me that that was a much more powerful critique of absolute monarchy to take the king's head off after a civil war than debating things in literary salons in France. So I, that's my kind of... As I understood it, and, and maybe, maybe I didn't, maybe I don't understand it well, but as I understood it, one of the points of 
bringing up Rousseau was saying that even though it was incidental at the time, it ended up being a mind virus that spread um, uh, to the, the intellectuals. And then somebody on the Tuesday call said that the intellectuals who were too lazy to really critique it. Um, and then into, you know, it, it just it was a mind virus that has taken over and it still exists with us today. You also yeah, I, I, think, <clears throat> I think that's right, but that, that's amongst um, 18th century enlightenment thinkers yeah. who are kind of intellectuals and academics. Whereas if you're looking at things on the ground in real action, the English had a sort of modern state and the scientific method up and running by the year 1700, a half a century before, before this stuff was going on. Yeah. And they were operating it, but they didn't bother to um, debate it or, or intellectualize about it. And I think that is much more powerful than it being a kind of sub subject of academic debate. Yeah. Uh, and I think that kind of neglect of that is a bit interesting. <laughs> so th that seems to be, be far more important and far more powerful. You also wonder what uh, the Reformation had to do with this year. You have this 30 year war from 1618 to 1648 um, that uh, was precipitated by you know, the Martin Luther Reformation here, yeah. particularly the religious yeah. wars. And uh, the breaking of power from a centralized Roman Catholic Church, which at the time you know, was so powerful that no one in the royal family could marry without permission from the Pope, right? So the influence, this centralized influence over the entire European leadership um, was, was an amazing phenomena, basically a perpetuation of the Roman Empire you know, as a theocracy. Uh, and, and I think we poorly understand the, the absolute power that the church had over the entire mm -hmm. European uh, uh, um, uh, sphere. So Martin Luther broke that uh, by creating a paradigm shift you know, in the way that um, the, the religious understanding of, uh, you know, of uh, the, uh, the church was a, a return to New Testament thinking, basically, what he was saying, was saying, hey, you know, yeah, here's yeah. what the New Testament really is saying, here's what you guys are doing, it's a total contradiction. So it had come into a power play. So I wonder... Um, how, how much it, it, what 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 I find uh, the challenging here is while we are focusing on the power structures within a civilization within a culture, there's also a dynamic between cultures, right? Sure. So so the Europeans for some reason. Uh, have more focused on developing uh, tools of warfare, right? Uh, uh, have had the most advanced weaponry. I mean, the Chinese uh, developed gunpowder long before the Europeans, but thought it was too violent a means of warfare, you know, to be deployed in war, whereas the Europeans were totally excited about having, uh, you know, a better way to blow each other up instantly, right? I mean, the first thing that came to yeah. their mind. So, so what is the collective mindset, right, that drives a, a civilization, a group, you know, to, to, to behave and to interact within uh, the, the, the world of, uh, uh, within a global uh, uh, set of, of other cultures where the Europeans for some reason had this sense of superiority, entitlement, um, you know, uh, uh, winner take all sort of thing, where they encountered vastly superior civilizations. When you think about India or China at the time, spiritually far more advanced, um, but yet defenseless because without this focus on weaponry. Because when you, you really have to look at this from a global perspective, you know, how the Europeans interacted globally was just incomprehensible in hindsight, right? I mean, whether that's uh, the, the Incas or the American Indians or India or China. Um, I mean, the, the, the havoc that the Europeans have wrecked across the world 
with this uh, plunder and, ex and uh, extortion is just incomprehensible. So now what's in the head that, that, that makes that possible? Yeah. Well, one of the things that Klaus that I think is very significant is you see, if you look at the English traders, the British traders in India during the 18th century, they turned up and learned to be courtiers. In other words, in the 18th century, the, the, the English guys that turned up fell in love with India and they often had Indian wives. They learned the languages and they also uncovered the history of India, which the Indians didn't know about. Like they, they discovered the connections between Sanskrit and Greek and Latin. And, and they did all this out of sheer love of the place. But they wonder when this weird transition into the 19th century, where they turned themselves into a kind of caste on top of the caste system. But in the 18th century, they weren't like that. Uh, so it, went, it underwent a transition, which is really interesting. And I think people kind of neglect that. And in it, to a large extent, Cortes, when he turned up in Mexico, and when um, he was the guy that can't, that can't turn up in, uh, certainly when he turned up in Mexico, he walked into the middle of a civil war because the, the Aztecs had only been the dominant power in Mexico for a hundred years when Cortes arrived and they were doing, they were capturing prisoners of war and sacrificing them on top of pyramids with obsidian blades and tearing their hearts out and doing all sorts of terrible things. And Cortes defeated them by walking into the middle of a civil war where the other people who hated them used Cortes to overthrow them. It's, it, it, you know, that's actually the history. The, and likewise in India, the, the Indian powers who were at each other's throats and also in the middle of a kind of civil war, they thought they could use the Europeans to get a military edge over their enemies in India and try to use the, the Europeans to fight each other, not realizing that that was gonna end up with the Europeans being in charge of the place. So in other words, to a large extent, it was the disunity within those civilizations and a civil war and the people locally thought they could exploit the Europeans powers in their own fights and didn't realize that it was a dangerous thing to do because it would end up with the Europeans dominating them. So they fell into a trap by indeed being disunited and fighting each other, thinking they could exploit the Europeans, not realizing the Europeans were going to outwit them. So that's what, it, that's what happened. So another way of looking at this is the British, when they came to China, were deeply interested in getting silk and tea. Was those were the two? Absolutely, there. of course they were. Yeah, they were. But the Chinese had absolutely no interest in 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 anything that the British had to trade. So the Apart British from people, silver, silver. They well, wanted silver well, quality. They didn't. They didn't really want to give up that much silver, right? So instead, the British. No, no. no. They, yeah, they forced so that, okay, the British okay, okay, to pay. Come. They forced the British to pay in silver bullion. Okay, let yeah? me maybe finish, and we can. Yeah, sorry. Turn, yeah. Um, so the British went to India, you know, calling opiates. Yeah. And, then they, and they went to, to China with the opioids and sold opioids. Yep. And, and, and then they turned that into silk and tea and went back to Britain with it. So they yep. created a very profitable triage. And then the Chinese then decided that they have a serious drug problem here and tried to, uh, uh, to stop that. And the emperor at the time put a general in charge you know, to, to finish this drug trade and fight with and, and, and push back on the British, that resulted into the Boxer War, which subdued the Chinese and forced the Opium War. The Opium them, War. The box, you know? yeah. It's the Opium War. The Boxer War was in about the year 1900. That's a later one. It's the yeah. Opium, Opium Wars. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah so, yeah, so that's not so benign, right? I mean, that has no, no, it's, the, it's the equivalent. No, I'm, I'm not saying that was benign. That was the equivalent of the Medellin cartel having better weapons than the US state yeah, to force right. the Americans into buying cocaine from them. 
that and then was you, I, then I, you can go it, it was it, yeah you can go to European cities you go to Marseille you know and you see plush you go to Portugal you go to Portugal Lisbon you see enormous wealth 19th century wealth on display you see obscene wealth on display you know in at at the uh uh, uh, at the Corp, um, uh, at the Vatican in Rome, obscene right, collection of wealth that was exploited from uh, uh, the colonies, so to speak. So I understand what you're saying, but I don't mm. think that really reflects what Europeans have been truly engaging here, which is plunder and mayhem across the world to extract uh, to extract value. I mean, for example, I was in France and I didn't even realize that I went through a museum in Marseille and, and I was just like stunned because they would sail to, to the uh, African coast, load the ship full of slaves, ship them to the Americas, you know, trade it in for tobacco and, and cotton uh, and then ship that to England and distribute it. So they became wealthy beyond belief by this trade of between slaves and then the agricultural products from, from the Americas. So, so there, there is a, a cynical collaboration that happened uh, at the business level between the Europeans, whether that's the Portuguese, the Spaniards, the French, the British, everybody in it, um, that, that, that caused uh, uh, amazing havoc. And you have to think, what is the mindset that, that drives this? Is this religion? Was that the Christianity? I mean, how, how could we have... I, I, think it, I think it's actually success that drove it. The, the characteristic of that, you know, acquisitional, um, uh, very assertive, uh, colonial uh, and rapacious, taking everything, um, that mindset is, it, it, I'm going to use the, the phrase again, it's kind of like a mind virus. Once, once that starts happening in a little, uh, small scale, um, the people who are more cultured um, are, are like food for that, that virus. So I think just the success of that approach meant that you know they would they would grow faster and and dig into the other cultures around the world and take over um so i it's a i i like your question i like the way it's like so you know so like you know you're a civilized person or a barbarian or something like that what what comes into your mind to go you know i'm going to be a slaver today i'm go i'm just going to take other people's stuff and their lives and I'm going to accrue to, accrue to, to me and my buds, right? Um, but once that gets going, once it ignites, it keeps going, it keeps building, I think, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, Africans were sl sl enslaving each other and, and trading each other uh, for about a thousand years. Uh, they were trading into, into the Middle East. So there, were, there was slave trading going on in Africa for at least a thousand years, but the slaves are being shipped into the Middle East across the Sahara. So, what's the difference? So, is so, there a difference? Is there a difference between that slave trade and the the European slave trade to the Americas? Is it well, scale? What was, is it viral? Well, what, uh, what actually virulent? happened there? Yeah, yeah. What happened was the other thing that people forget is that the Venetians were trading slaves. Uh, from the north of the, of the um, Black Sea to Constantinople and Cairo. The Venetians were doing that. And there was also slave, slave trading at Lyon in France in the um, 12th, 13th century. There were places where they created eunuchs. So they, they sent slaves from, from uh, north of the Black Sea to Lyon, where they castrated them and then resold them into the Middle East. So this slave trading stuff, people have been trading slaves ever since, in quotes, the dawn of civilization. Yeah, but, but that's not my point. All that actually happened was that the, um, the Europeans opened up a new transatlantic market. So the Venetians invented in slave, slave um, 
uh, using slaves to grow sugar cane and process sugar in the island of Crete in the Mediterranean before anybody thought of doing that in the Caribbean. The Venetians invented it and then they used the same model to, to do it in places like Madeira and then across to the Caribbean. But it was invented by the Venetians, those civilized Venetians, way before it ever happened anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, you can go back you know, 5,000 years and there were slaves, right? I mean, the Israelis were slaves. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Time, so it's not, I, I, it's not yeah, what I'm really referring to. What, what I'm really saying is, what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to get to is, there is a collective mindset, you know, irrespective of the hierarchy within this mindset, there is a collective mindset, you know, that drives an entire society, a civilization, to act in certain ways, to where a slave trade is normalized, the exploitation of other cultures is normalized, war is normalized, right? So, so where, how, how does this mindset originate? Um, how do you change it? How, uh, what, what type of mindsets are more conducive to lead us into the future versus holding us back in the past? Yeah, I mean, the um, slavery collapsed when the Roman Empire collapsed in Western Europe, yeah? But it only collapsed in Western Europe. It, was, it continued in the more civilized Middle East. It was not without any interruption. What reintroduced the idea that slavery was a good thing in Europe was Renaissance. It was the Italian Renaissance. When they rediscovered ancient Greece and Rome, they thought they were more civilized because they had slaves. So it was the Renaissance thinkers who introduced the idea that slavery was good back to Europe because they thought one of the reasons why Europe was backward was because they'd abandoned slavery when the Roman Empire collapsed in about fifth century AD. So, so the idea had never died out in, uh, in the Middle East uh, or anywhere in the Islamic world. Uh, it got reintroduced to Europe by the Rena Italian Renaissance, which we we're all supposed to think was a great thing. Sorry, we're not really, we're, we're talking about broader pictures. I mean, basically, the European powers got powerful militarily because they spent all their time fighting each other. They were fighting each other. They were not thinking about anyone else, but they got their military edge because the Portuguese fought the Spaniards, um, then, then the Dutch fought the Spaniards, and then the, then Louis the Fifth, Fourteenth tried to conquer Europe uh, on behalf of the Pope. So it was the Europeans fighting each other that created this arms race. It, it, and then they and then they applied it somewhere else. But it was from them fighting each other and hating each other that it all developed. So so then Europe is kind of a kettle where where that ended up boiling into yeah. and then spilling out. And, and then they applied it in other places, but but it yeah. evolved in the competition between the, between European powers. I mean, you know, the 30 years war that Klaus referred to, 30, uh, 16, 18, 1648, killed probably between 25 and 30% of everybody in the central Europe. It was a total nightmare. And the Treaty of Westphalia that, it, that ended it created the legal framework, which is now the legal framework for international law. So all of international law comes from the Treaty of Westphalia to stop the war that killed between 25 and 30 percent of everybody in Central Europe. It's an interesting time to reflect on, so this reformation, because there was a belief system that had evolved after you know, the Roman Empire fell and the uh, theocracy of Christianity had been established with the Pope you know, taking power and this interesting system where you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the Pope and the uh, uh, hierarchy, the, the Catholic hierarchy couldn't marry, meaning they couldn't have offspring, meaning they couldn't perpetuate wealth you know, to the next generation. So the wealth all fell back to the church uh, when, when uh, a bishop or cardinal passed away. So that yeah. was an interest, that was an interesting 
way to perpetuate that power structure, right? But then it, it then it uh, and it did well for for the beginning because the the Christians basically uh, uh, were able to obtain power by focusing on uh, the base of pyramid economy on the poorest people, you know, on on people who who were uh, uh, dis, dis, disenfranchised by the Roman Empire at the time. But then it, it co-opted and over time it became just you now a very sophisticated uh, extraction scheme uh, that encompassed the entire European continent. So, so when Martin Luther came up saying, breaking that spell, because no one really knew how to engage this enormous power structure, but Martin Luther broke that spell. You know, he made presentations to uh, the European royals um, who, uh, who you know, came to agree with him. Here's the book. So, and, and, and with that, uh, freeing themselves from the church because the church was extracting royal, uh, royalties, uh, which should have been tax money. It went instead to the church, right? Because they were selling these uh, um, forgiveness uh, uh, papers. Indulgences. That, so, yeah. Indulgences. So, so and, and that impacted the entire revenue generation of uh, the individual states. And so by breaking that apart, but the, 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 the impressive thing here is that an idea like that, that, they, they, that, I, that Martin Luther brought forth, shifted the mindset, created a paradigm shift, which then redirected the behavior of a significant part of it, the European court. And also caused 200 years of catastrophic religious warfare. <laughs> right, right, totally, but, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, yeah. Was, it was disastrous, particularly for the German speaking lands, an absolute catastrophe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so part of I mean, that what, was the, the printing yeah. press, right? That was- Yeah, the printing press is a really important thing because that was the basis of the propaganda and the leafleting and you know, Luther came along just at the point where printing with movable type got going, and the transition into speaking into publishing being in vernacular languages instead of being in Latin. So it's a very complex. You know, there's a lot of depth to what was going on. Um, there's a kind of sense in which Graeber and and Wenger are kind of they're concentrating on about 1750 onwards and they're kind of missing a whole complex kind of web of stuff that goes right back to the foundation of the universities in the 13th century and the knowledge for that all came from Islamic Spain. Uh, you know, the whole kickstarting of European recovery in the 13th century is all from knowledge that, that is taken by translating from Arabic into Latin in Toledo in Spain. And then that kickstarts the, the knowledge about Aristotle, which is the backbone of the foundation of the University of Paris and the University of Oxford and the University of Padua. So, so the kickstarting of re reassertion of knowledge in Europe, it all comes from Muslim Spain, which then got persecuted mercilessly by the Spaniards and they drove out, drove out everybody, the Jews and the um, uh, uh, and the and the Muslims uh, forcibly. Spanish Inquisition, you know. Um, it's a mess. <laughs> it, it's it's a complicated mess. It's very very complex. Um, like and to a large know. extent, th these struggles were between you know Protestants and Catholics and and. The absolutist French monarchy trying to conquer the whole of Europe, the Dutch pushing back against the Spaniards. I mean, it's, it's bizarrely complicated. It's a rich picture. There's much more of it than what comes out of this book. It's much, much deeper. Sorry to, there's a, a sense in which we're kind of not talking about the book, but we're giving, you know, we're kind of, kind of contextualizing a story that's much deeper, I think. Bill, speak. Yes, I appreciate the, the um, deeper story. The thing that struck me was Klaus's original question, which I think Graeber and Wenger were trying to poke at 
in this chapter is like, can we like admit that there are people with that have more imaginative ways of organizing their socio-political setups? So for me, the value of this book is in a question like that. And then the question that Klaus asks, which I think comes up later in the book, I'm in chapter four or five or something. In later in the book is when they start to like talk about, well, slavery on the West Coast of the uh, United States, California and the Northern, whatever. But, but Klaus's question, I think is one of the big takeaways you could take from this book because it really is a question for today. And I was just reminded two or three years ago, I came across Albert Camus' little essay called Neither Victims Nor Executioners an ethics superior to murder. It's a very short little essay in which Camus after World War II was pretty much devastated, like holy moly, what kind of species are we? And uh, his question was to just agree that we were not going to use organized murder as a way to get our way in the world, which you know, as Trevor Kosciuk pointed out, basically the reason the European, Europeans took over is they got, they were so much better at fighting in war that the rest of the world who was also progressing into better ways of trying to like, what the hell's going on here? Were unable to, you know, they just couldn't, they couldn't, couldn't resist it. They got, they got basically all out fought. But Camus was saying, look, I'm not saying people aren't going to murder each other. That That's always going to happen. I am saying, though, as a country, we are not going to, that's, we're going to choose not to use that as a method. And so he's trying to make a moral argument here. Hmm. You know, and he says, and if we get into a group, a group of nations and one of the nations says, yeah, well, we don't really believe, you know, we're not going to behave that way. He says, well, thank you. Now we know exactly what you are capable of. Right? There's no secret message here. And so we can take whatever defensive you know, things we need to do. You know, but he has a, I thought this essay for me was really, he's living here in the US with all the crazy kind of talk because he has a company, he says a person who you cannot reason with is a person to be feared. Well, yeah, the other thing you gotta remember is the aristocrats, the aristocratic elites in India and in China, Chinese emperor, these people, aristocrats traditionally in, since again, you know, since the dawn of Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago, it is the tradition that aristocrats are specialists in fighting war. That's what they do. Yeah. Well, they mention or, they, they, they yeah. mention that in this. They make a, a distinction between that when in this chapter four or something. They actually bring yeah. that out. Um, sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, but um, the point is that the, the, it, 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 it's quite mistaken to think that the Europeans were crueler than I the didn't say cruel. This, this monster book no, I, I read about the birth of the modern world by C. A. Bailey. Yeah. So from seventeen eight. This is like a G. But he basically said. They weren't crueler. They were just better. Yeah, because fighting. basically aristocrats, <laughs> by definition, they, 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 they fight war and they punish people who don't obey them. I mean, that's, that's the traditional aristocratic elite. They're, well, like, yeah, so um, I, they're like the mafia, basically. So, so, so the elites in places like India and China, they, their value system to us is like the value system of the Godfather in the in in you know Marlon Brando is the Godfather in the movie. They're like yes, but mafia that, people. Yes, but I still think for me the value of this book is basically raising the questions like Klaus said, and when you actually Klaus you posted that you know that letter from Tolstoy, which regardless of how mm. one can read it, Tolstoy. I mean, he was dead serious when he wrote those words about love. He wasn't making stuff up, nor is the Dalai Lama making stuff up, nor is my the Zen teacher I had making stuff up when, you know, the one who said, here, thoughts, what are they? Here, show me one. 
bring one to me. You know, they're trying to, this is like, for me, and maybe it's just where I am now in trying to make sense, make our own sense of what's happening and what we as a species are doing on the planet, is that the, the value of this book is just to be more open-ended questioning, regardless of, you know, the whatever blinders or whatever proscribed perspective the authors have taken to create their points. I will say Peter posted in the Mattermost chat, oh, here is some, you know, two big reviews of the really negative reviews of the book. And it's, yeah. and I looked at, I started to read one. I said, I am not going to read them because I have not finished the book. I do not want to read the book with the ideas of these critics who say, look, these, you know, these people could have opened the Executive Britannica and had a better, you know, I don't even want to read that. I want to read what these people have to say sure. first. And cool. then I'll read what, you know, the, the critiques are. But I still think that, the, for me, the value is in the, the question Klaus asks about how are, and I think it raises how are we as, you know, nations in a world now created of nation states going to behave. Right, because there's no externalities for the economists to say, "Oh, we'll just pump it into the air." Sorry, it's already full. So, um, that's for me where I think this. For me, that's why the value of this. Although I do see, you know, I have some critiques of. Uh, they make claims, so of course. Yeah, I mean, I think. Um... I suppose one of the things that kind of interests me there is that the kind of critique of absolutist monarchy, uh, the French needed that because they still had an absolutist monarchy in 1750. And it, the irony is, I mean, actually, there's a brilliant PBS, um, I watched on, on PBS America, uh, Ken Burns's. Um, Doc documentary about Benjamin Franklin and it was very very good and of course Franklin spent a lot of time doing diplomacy in France in the 1770s and 80s to get the French to keep the, the British at bay so that they could win their war of independence uh, but of course when he was there France was still uh, it was Louis the Sixteenth, and it was still an absolute monarchy. Um, and the irony is that in the process of Benjamin Franklin was a very, very good diplomat, and he got the French to fund what was necessary for you for, for USA to become independent of the British. But by accident, he also introduced to the French the idea of a revolutionary. Um, uh, state, we hold these truths to be uh, uh, self-evident, etc., which destabilized France. France went bankrupt financing the, 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 the independence of the USA and its bankruptcy and collapse and the sowing of the ideas that Benjamin Franklin brought caused the French Revolution. <laughs> so, so the irony is that that France was an absolutist monarchy when he was there, which is the kind of time when, when, when this chapter is about what was going on in, in France. But it accidentally led to the collapse of the absolute monarchy in France and, and the, the French Revolution, which I think is deeply ironic. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I posted... Uh, um, the uh, visionary theories of Pitirim Sorokin, Culture in Crisis, and I was trying to get an extract out of it, but for some reason it doesn't let me copy paste. But what Sorokin basically argues is there are, uh, there's a sensate materialistic culture, which he you know, thinks that the Western world has been in for the last 500 years. There's an ideational and spiritual culture um, and then there is an integral combining those two. And he argues that there is a crisis of transition 
you know, when a sensate or ideational culture reaches a certain point of decline, social and economic crisis mark the beginning of this transition to a new mentality. Um, and he's arguing that as established institutions try to maintain control and try to maintain order, they're actually making it worse because they are, they are perpetuating a status quo that has actually caused the calamity that we are in. So that then short term results in totalitarianism, fascism, monarchical theocracies and so on structures, um, which uh, oftentimes and most often lead to uh, uh, the society disintegrating and, and breaking apart, meaning leading towards evolutionary changes you know, that create a lot of damage and, 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 uh, and hardship. Um, so so to, to develop a positive transformational change process is really what we are looking for at this point, right? I mean, the reason we're reading this book and, and, and thinking about what happened in the past is how can you apply this to the moment of now and into the future. Mm, absolutely. And, and so my uh, uh, you know, hypothesis here is it, it requires a reformation, meaning a paradigm shift in the way that we understand the world in the way it works in the way it functions. But, and this is what Tolstoy's argument was, when you have a, a mature, uh, sensate uh, 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 culture, then you have a, an elite that is that is that whose fortunes are linked up with the perpetuation of the system as it is, right? So when you are mm -hmm. looking at today, I mean, think about uh, the shifts and changes required uh, to maintain a living planet that uh, will have profound impacts on some 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 very powerful people and and money and finances and multinational power structures, corporations, and so on. So, so that's, that is you know, the challenge we're facing, I think, and, and, and we have gone global you know, for the first time. I mean, before, if the Europeans slaughtered each other, that was too bad, but it didn't really bother anybody in India or China, right? Yeah. But today, I mean, the conflict in the Ukraine has immediate impacts on the food supply for uh, Africa, for the Middle East, right? Profound, uh, profound consequences. So how you know, this, this is you know, sort of my, 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 my uh, preoccupation is how do you find levers you know, that shift a mindset, that shifts that paradigm that we're stuck in uh, to the point where it's an aha. So when Martin Luther uh, came up with his thesis and nailed them on the church door, he found a receptive audience because the time was right, right? The, the leadership, the European leadership was completely frustrated with the Roman Catholic Church. They have been searching for a way out of this without getting engulfed in a war and, and, and finding you know, a, a peaceful transition uh, that would make sense to them, uh, which worked out short term. Of course, then it you know, disintegrated long term into 30 years of war. But mm. But the, the, you know, the idea to find a way to catalyze a mind shift you know, is, is, um, um, is, is the challenge, I think. Yeah, no, I agree with you completely. And uh, I mean, I think we are at that kind of a juncture now because, well, not the people who actually are you know, in the status quo, like here in Texas, the people who pump oil and gas, you know, have still not gotten that message, you know, from their studies of thermodynamics in college about how it's all working out yet. But their kids have, even if they don't bring it up to the table at dinner. You know, so things are really in a shifting mode here. And uh, so, I think that's potentially really good. Yeah, well, I think, of, the Leonard I think, Cohen thing, right? That's where, you know, the cracks, that's where the light comes in. Well, things are cracked. Yeah. So I, it's possible. 
you know, sorry, but yeah. No, no, that's fine, Bill. Um, I think the point, you see, if you, if you look at the kind of history, I think of, of any culture at all, you can see that there are certain points where it has certain degrees of freedom, usually caused by some kind of ecological stress. I mean, it's always, if you, if you look at the history of the human race, transitions, uh, even in evolutionary terms, are often associated with some kind of climatic shift. So for example, there's pretty strong evidence now that the Roman Empire started to grow, uh, become more, more powerful in about second century BC, because the climate in the Mediterranean it made agriculture more productive. So there, because, of, because of wealth creation was all about agriculture, there was a rise in wealth that enabled the Roman Empire to spread and become dominant in wars against the Carthaginians and whatnot. And in about 200 AD, the climate shifted back again and the agricultural productivity collapsed, but nobody knew what the hell was going on. And that was the, the sort of stress that led to a lot of migration of people out of Central Asia and swarms of Huns coming from across the grassland to trying to get into the Roman Empire. So in other words, there has always been a kind of connection between cultural shifts and climate change and also um, disease. But previously, nobody could understand what the hell was going on. And they tended to fall into believing that they needed to realign themselves with some kind of divine power or something. Uh, no, that's okay. To, to, I think to that's... correct the problem. Well, uh, I mean, we're I the they... we're... go ahead. But, I mean... We are in a similar shift. I mean, we are. But we're also in but the I same think... boat, right? Well, oh, there's going to yeah. be a technological fix for the climate thing. I just, I could feel it. It's always happened. You know, I'm like, yeah. It's like, yeah. Right? Seriously? You're going to spend $44 billion to buy a social media company instead of funding <laughs> science? <laughs> 44, $44 billion? Excuse well, me? <laughs> well, no, the trouble is, no, that's, we're not, I mean, we can say, he's in it, who knows? I don't, you know, but that's just a fact. The thing that's funny, what Klaus said was like, in a way, or maybe Trevor was you, but like, you no, a class about the war in Ukraine, right? Just broke everything apart. So we're in this, like, for me, this is going to be very uh, kind of crude, superficial, but we're in this, like, neoclassical mindset, this market-driven, individualistic, you know, this sort of invisible hand, although it's got a few strings, forget it, but this invisible hand, we all do our own thing for our own best interest, and it'll all be great. And so now we're completely interconnected in a world where we completely deny our interdependence. Just as a, you know, as a Buddhist, I'm like, yeah, you can't get away from it. I mean, at dinner, yeah, I try is, almost the, when I eat, I try to tell you a little bit of a grace to like the, you know, thousands of people that made it possible for me to have food on the plate. Yeah. That I don't know the big, anything the about. The biggest risk we've got at the moment is that there are two, I mean, R Russia is a dying totalitarian power. And this war shows it's dying. But the totalitarian power you really got to watch out for is China. Because China is still dominated by the Chinese Communist Party, which is as ruthless and vicious as the Soviet Communist Party ever was. It's a nasty, nasty piece of work. And, and also, totally and totalitarian. Also, well, and also they're Chinese. It's like, yeah, we got a long view. We're a freaking civilization. I'm not sure they We're not really a nation got, state. Right? No, I think they, I, well, in the culture, there is this, they've been around for a long, 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 long time. I mean, I'm here in the United sure. States. It's like, a, it's like a baby nation here. Oh, yeah. That's true. Right. As a nation. Yeah. So, so uh, they have a different, a uh, totally different, you know, to put, you know, to build their own space station. So, fuck you guys. Thanks for the education at MIT and Caltech. We'll take it from here. You know, <laughs> that's how I, it's like. <laughs> so um, I think that's true, but in, at least in the United States, we are like it, the leadership, you know, we just got our heads in the sand here. Like I yeah, think we need I mean, more, we need more sand because more heads need, want to be buried, so. 
but the you, shortage. You also got to remember that the kind of conversations we're having here would be illegal if we were Chinese. <laughs> this would not be allowed. By many countries, that would not be allowed. Yeah. No, it wouldn't. Well, it wouldn't. It wouldn't no, it wouldn't. Well, maybe That's not like this, right. but we might be able to do it around sure. it. At, you know, a tea table in my house. Yeah, as long as nobody's listening. Yeah, yeah even, yeah. And Russia, you wouldn't uh, uh, at this point, point in time. No, no you wouldn't. No. But see, the, the, the American um, um, society culture, you know, has a unique opportunity to rise beyond, to rise above, you know, and beyond this thing, because there is inherently a spirit here that is that has gotten buried you know, that has gotten uh, rolled underneath this corporate financial uh, uh, mass that that, uh, that evolved, uh, particularly, I would say, after Reagan, you know, where this came, uh, where there was a syst systematic dismantling of uh, the, mm -hmm. the Roosevelt uh, uh, state that had been so beneficial to so many people. Um, and so the question is, uh, do we have the collective strength you know, to, to reincarnate uh, what the original idea here was all about? Because the entire world is looking for a beacon right, to, uh, to, to follow, and we have lost it. Right? I mean, we have just... So, so right now, with this engagement in the Ukraine, um, that, that, that really is you know, the kind of leadership that, that the world expects from us. But we have failed in so many on so many occasions. When you think Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, my God, you know how much what a mess we have made. Oh, not I mean not us as citizens, but the comp the corporations that are running under the American flag, right? The mess they have made uh, in South America. I mean the British people themselves didn't have anything to do with colonialism that was done by the companies. You know, that where the, the what was it called? Well, the, it's that's not entirely true. It got kind of taken into the public sector after 1857. Before that, it was entirely a private enterprise, but it did get yeah. taken over by the state. You know, Queen Victoria was the Empress of India. <laughs> well, only, yeah, after about 18, only after about 1870. Yeah, well, so, we'll so you had this merging, but, but there was, uh, 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 I mean, we have allowed this corruption to enter you know, our society to where you know, these, these uh, entities now have more power than the state. And we are collectively apparently unable you know, to reconstitute the strength of the state to take control and to start reining this in again. You know, and, and so, and again, there is this mindset shift. You know, how do you enter, where are the leverage points in the system that you can pull on to shift it into a different track. Yeah, no, I think yeah. so. Living at living Good in questions. Texas, yeah, that's. A, I mean, those are those are the questions. And here in Texas, the thing that is mostly concerns me living in Texas is not that there aren't uh, you know liberal and progressive people here, but m many <laughs> people don't vote. So by that act they have basically have decided for themselves, the government can do whatever it wants because I am going to be okay. And that only works until all of a sudden they're not okay. But here in America, I would say at least among the white folk, most are pretty much okay with the uh, unequal distribution of uh, healthcare and wealth because they keep electing people who don't change it or staying away from the polls. So it's like, I, you know, that's why when people say we're gonna have to really start constituting some distributed autonomous outside gov, you know, separate from government. I mean, it's, this is why it's for me a little odd because I think at one level we have to leverage everything we know about global governance. Yeah, I mean, the Chinese have demonstrated, Xi Jinping has demonstrated very, very well that the power of corporations is an illusion. And if a powerful 
the state steps in and slaps them down, that's it. They lose a trillion dollars of value overnight. They're not as powerful as they pretend they are. Unfortunately, it's only the Chinese at the moment that have got uh, the will to exert that power over them. So isn't that what chapter two is about? This little discussion between the indigenous Americans about the French It's like, you people, are got, you got all this private property, you're collecting all this shit, you got people starving on the street corner and that's not happening here. You know, if it's snowing outside and it's below zero, you know, people are intense. They're not like freezing to death yeah. on the street. So yep. like, what, is, what is with you people? That doesn't look civilized at all. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I, I know a guy, he's dead now, but I knew a very interesting guy who was an Afghan. A very distinguished family from Afghanistan. Uh, he, when he visited the USA in the 1970s, he visited somebody, a friend of his, who was an American, who was in hospital. And he went to visit him in hospital, and he noticed that the the, the bed had a, had somebody's name on 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 the on the on the sort of board at the back, a sort of mm -hmm. plaque with somebody's name on it. And he said, "Well, what? Why is there somebody's name on this bed?" And he, the guy in the bed, explained to him that it was because it had been funded by this guy who was a philanthropist. The Afghan was so disgusted to, to an Afghan. That was so barbaric. I mean, talk about an indigenous critique. We're talking about a modern Afghan in the 1970s who looked at that and thought, that is disgusting because the only real philanthropy is secret charity. That is not philanthropy. That is somebody buying something. He thought that that was utter barbarism. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's an indigenous critique, if you want one, from an no, Afghan perfect. in the 1970s. Well, yeah. yeah, but that also comes from you know, yeah. what kind of a society is this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know, I was born in 1949 in Germany, and uh, as a little boy, my, my parents operated a restaurant, so they were working in the evening. And at the time, you know, there, there was only like one or two television channels in Germany, and the Allies made uh, uh, the Germans run the video clips from the, the from the, the uh, extermination camps. So I remember as like three, four, five year old boy, I was sitting there in the evening watching black and white films and the Nazis filmed the most incredible things. I mean, incomprehensible uh, slaughter, you know, scenarios there. It totally traumatized me. And um, so then, then, and then you couldn't talk about it, right? Because my, my parents were like, uh, I mean, under no circumstances can this be a conversation. It would get really uh, aggressive when, when I was asking questions. And so in general, that whole generation there was either in denial, you know, it didn't happen or it's, it's exaggerated or uh, we're, we're, we're uh, struggling with it, you know, in, in, in other ways. And, so I spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about how is this even possible that all these people around me here, you know, were, were uh, uh, obviously engaged uh, passively or actively in doing this. And then I had some really uncomfortable learnings from my own family, you know, my grandfather and so on. I mean, horrible stuff. And so, so I went, I came across this, this video clip from Bonhoeffer, I just posted it. Now Bonhoeffer, of course, was a pastor who was uh, outspoken yeah. and so on. His conclusion really was, because he pondered forever, how can these normal people you know, all of a sudden throw stones into Jewish uh, uh, shops, uh, rat out their neighbors who are Jewish and, you know, and, and participate in this insanity? Um, and so, so he came to the conclusion that it's not malice you have to be very worried about. It's stupidity you have to worry about. Now, stupidity is, I mean, the way he frames this may be a little controversial, but what he basically means, I think what, what he's referring to are people who have lost um, the ability of independent thought, uh, who, who have surrendered uh, their, 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 their independent thinking. Um, and there's a number of reasons that you see it in Russia right now. 
how they're stamping out any kind of dissent and force you know, collective thinking as, as incongruent as it may be. And, and so the, the challenge we have right now here is that what Russia does with raw force, right? I mean, pulling people off the street and throw you in prison for 15 years, we are doing with an amazingly sophisticated propaganda network that's just as efficient. It's just as efficient. I mean, it is incredible how public uh, sentiment can be controlled and manipulated you know, with this propaganda that, that, is, that is put out there. And so, so we, are, we are basically in an information war, right? We are in, in, a, in, in a fight over who controls the public discourse. And, and until, until that can be resolved in, in, in some form or shape, we will continue to drift you know, uh, aimlessly into from one mess into the next. Yeah, you know, this just, my wife is uh, Jewish and uh, um, we started watching Simon Shama's uh, History of the Jews. It was a five part series on PBS or I don't know. It was it's on Amazon Prime. She bought the book, but decided maybe it would be easier to, you know, it's pretty thick. Anyway, super interesting, but what he says in the beginning of this thing about the reason the Jews have been able to move all over the world and basically be nomadic like that is that they didn't really need to bring a temple. All they needed to bring was a book. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> a book and its <laughs> commentaries, right? So, and he was making a point about the United States, which is something that we have lost. I feel I'm, from what Klaus, from what you're saying, is that this is a country that is not was founded on an idea, not on a religion, not on a territory, not on these other things that have defined, you know, nations like our you know, agricultural region, or it was founded on an idea that's written down in our, you know, declaration and in the constitution. And, you know, it, as a nation founded on an idea and a nation founded on laws, not on this. So that's what made it different than many other you know, different than monarchies and different than basically landowners and, you know, the empires of the, <laughs> the past, which, you know, the Ottoman Empire only ended in 19, what, 18, so not so long ago. Um, yeah. So this is, in a way, the challenge we are, because I think in, we're not, it, I feel that in America, this, we are not reminded about what this nation is founded on. I mean, I had my own representative, a very conservative Republican, send me a religious, a Christian religious, religious message by his formal email on Easter. And I wrote right back to him and told him it was completely inappropriate. <laughs> no, and I said, why don't you stand up, you know, this is for, you know, you, for you to use your official email for this kind of message. It's just, oh, but, that's yeah. out of, out, you know, I've had conversations with people who said, oh, you know, well, this is a Christian nation. I said, no, it's a secular nation. But I, I, I got to say, really Klaus, uh, after Klaus took, sent, put out that the letter about from Tolstoy to, um, mm -hmm. to an Indian newspaper and, and, and the introduction to it by Gandhi, it prompted me to read a biography of Gandhi that was published in 2010. Mm -hmm. And actually, I have to say, you talk about stupidity, but it's quite embarrassing because it turns out that Gandhi thought Adolf Hitler was morally no different to the British Empire. He liked him because he was a vegetarian and he was kind to animals. He wrote a letter to him talking about his, how, him being his friend. In 1940, when the Germans were bombing the shit out of, out of, out of the cities in, in, in Britain, trying to conquer Britain. Um, and uh, on the other side, um, uh, Adolf Hitler had a meeting with Lord Halifax, the foreign secretary, and he said to him, this guy Gandhi, all you got to do to sort that out is shoot him. So Gandhi was saying that there was no difference between the British Empire and the Nazis. And Hitler was telling the British, all you got to do to sort out that guy 
is to shoot him and shoot other members of the Congress party. Now that looks pretty damn stupid to me, by the way. And that was Gandhi. Well, all I can say at my uh, ripe young age here is that uh, I'm only human. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, my, my, my wife reminds me that was a really stupid thing you just said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife frequently reminds me of the stupid things I say as well. But I understand it's a that. Service, so it's, it's a good service that, 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 that women do for us. Stupid man, I think it's, it's good. Yeah, we need it, to do it, keeps it for us, ourselves because they're it keeps like, us in our place. <laughs> well, I don't know if I've told you, but after well, during the Trump, when Trump, the whole thing, my wife, after Trump was elected, you know, she looks at me and she goes, Don't take it personally, I'm done with, I'm done with white men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife's Jewish as well. Actually. It's like, I am done. And <laughs> Well, I don't know if I you where you live, but there's you know there's a ton of more flagrant anti-Semitism here in Central Texas. You know, well, it's quite so scary. It's, to think that, yeah, that that, that that how anti-Semitic the USA was before before the Second World War. Well, they there were a whole lot of people. There were quotas to stop Jewish too many Jewish people going to college. Yeah, it was incredibly anti-Semitic. It was horrific. I know. I know. <laughs> well, and it still is a little. Well, I mean, it's still there's quite a bit of it because. Uh, I don't know. I still have faith. Is, I, still have faith in, I still have faith in humans, in humans as a species. Just, I read a philosopher who said one of the great uh, attributes of of Homo sapiens is non-genetic learning <laughs> which means a child does not have to behave like its parents because it could learn something different <laughs> yeah this is all true <laughs> there's hope for us yet man <laughs> uh, yeah i mean i mean history is fascinating i i, I love it to bits but I think one of the things that I think is really interesting is this question of the fact that there are moments where a culture can undergo a shift, but they like windows that open. And if you don't do the right thing at the right time, it goes like that and it shuts again and the culture can get stuck for hundreds of years. I mean, it's quite, quite disturbing. So this is something very, think, pers yeah. very personal I have to share with you because that just struck a bell. I was just talking with someone before, before lunch here, and this thing came up. Um, but years ago, I was in a particularly tough part of my life, and a good friend of mine was talking about you know, seeing a therapist, and he just said to me, he said, Bill, there's a door open for you right now, but it won't be open forever. Yeah. <laughs> and I took his advice, and it was you know, a wonderful thing I did. But I feel that's true here. Yep. And for those of us that are involved in the bigger open global mind, there is a possibility that there's a door open there now because we're becoming more uh, authentic or less guard, less defended in some of our interactions, but it also will not remain open forever. Yeah. Um, and there are and certain people trying to actively close it. Well, and this book by Bailey, I don't know if you read it, I learned so much about this uh, um, birth of the modern world, 1780 to 1914. So you know all about this, Trevor. But this just, it told me, and I've had this insight that we are in a similar position that the world was in, in the 1820s and 30s, in terms of so much change, so many new different ideas, like where people are thinking about, you know, autonomous decentralized computer run like all, yeah. something really different it's happening all over the world because we're connected but even in the 1830s it was happening all over the world even without a telegraph so yeah, there absolutely. is there is a we're in a moment i mean people or like, like Newton, a, a moment could be a 17th decade. century you know in the 17th century people like newton leibniz they they they, they were writing letters to each other 
It was known as the Republic of Letters. And what those guys could do, just corresponding with each other, but there were also absolutely people absolutely astonishing. But also people on the other side of the world were also noodling about these things. You know, it wasn't yeah. like just, oh yeah, there's just a bunch of bright guys in Europe. It's like, no. No, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I just feel we're in a, a nexus now that, uh, you know. I find that uh, Spiral Dynamics is, is uh, probably one of the best mind models to, to, to understand um, the, the, the structure, you know, and it's, it's not called levels. They have to purposefully avoid levels. They're calling it colors. And colors are <clears throat> a mindset, describe a mindset. So red, for example, you know, is a Donald Trump is red. You know? mm. and like pens is blue. You know? uh, and and the, the orange is maybe uh, Bill Gates, right? And then green is you know, the Sierra Club. You know? And so, so it's just, just very, very uh, roughly speaking, but there are mindsets, you know, and these mindsets create lenses for which we see the world. And uh, they, they, uh, um, uh, they, they basically drive our, our interaction with the system as such. So in any society, you have you know, people at different cognitive levels that those are levels, and then you have people in different places, you know, uh, depending on, uh, and, and you can have super highly intelligent people in red, blue, yellow, anywhere, right? This is not a matter of intelligence, it's a matter of mindset, belief system. And so to, in order to change, to shift a system, it has to, it has to change every single color within the system uh, in, in ways that are context specific to the individual. So, um, and, and, and when, you, when you think about a company, right? I mean, you have uh, a mega corporation that breaks down into different sectors, finance, marketing, PR, you know, uh, operations and what have you. And then within each one of these sections, you have levels of uh, uh, complexity to deal with you know, from you know, driving a forklift to organizing uh, the entire schedule. And, and so, so e for each person, you need to specify um, a set of, of uh, guidelines, of guideposts that allow the individual to function within the system. And a society like, like, like no, any, any civilization, any culture, any government, we are a system that is, that is like infinitely more complex than even a company is. But we, we have to figure somehow out how to run on the same base, right? So you, there has to be a governing set of, of uh, um, beliefs or mindsets that, that allow this whole system to function. Now Tolstoy argues that the only way to do this is empathy and many other things, right? Argue that the only clue that unites us you now is uh, our intention. So we have, if we, if, and, and which, which lead to trust. If we, if we are uh, in, in a group of, uh, of people who we trust their intentions, then oh, where, where we know their intentions, we can trust them. And, and so anyway, I mean, this is uh, 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 a little bit abstract here, but you know, I, I think until, until we have um, some kind of uh, uh, almost spiritual awakening to, to the, the situation we're facing, you know, a, a global uh, calamity, um, breakdown of, of uh, global ecosystems um, that, that require you know, specific actions to be taken, which means something different for a farmer than they do for a trucker or construction worker, you know, or for an engineer or a politician. Um, and until we have some kind of a unifying theory of, of how to engage, then we won't be able to collaborate. Yeah, well, thank you. I agree with you. I mean, is, it, is that the integrative Ken Wilber's stuff, isn't it? That sounds yeah. like Ken Wilber. 
Yeah, yeah. Integrative well, man management, or I can't remember what he's called it. This, this paper that I just posted here is is uh, a great summary um, by Don Beck yeah. and Christian Korn. I mean, it really. I, yeah. 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 Have I've you had, seen Fre had... Frederick Lalou's Reinventing Organizations? He's based on the same mm. foundations. Yeah. 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 I, I was but just going to is... say that. I was just going to say that the, some couple of Zen teachers that I've had said the same thing. You know, here's what has to change for everybody. It's, you know. Yeah, but for saying, each saying it doesn't make it happen. <laughs> Making well, it happen is a lot no, more no, difficult no, no, to no, say. No, it. no, it's up to, no, it's up to yeah, yeah. you know, what work can I, I know what work I can do. I am in control of doing about me. And I like what you said about intentions are what's guiding us. You know, although my wife pointed out once when I did something, I said I didn't mean to do it. She goes, I don't really care what you mean. I care what you did, your behavior. <laughs> Bang on. Because it's really, you, know, you can't divorce the two. No, it's very yeah. familiar to my wife, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, but well, I there's, a, it's, it's, there's it's that not... nice, there's that nice, sorry, Bill, go on. No, I was just saying, but it really, it's what action have you taken is what, you know, you're going to you know, it's, step it's on great your foot. principle yeah it's a brilliant principle i, I think yeah. i mentioned it in one of the mattermost channels this idea the purpose of a system is what it does exactly yeah Aussie with it's like if you want to understand the system don't just look at what it says you've got to look at what it does well you know what so this is a, I have a pay attention friend, to a that. software software architect i've known for years one of our closest friends and he keeps talking to people say well, here's this program. Here's what it does. He goes, I see what it does, but what's it for? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what I, what I like about spiral dynamics is that it makes you think how to structure what you're talking about to the person you're talking with. Right. So, for example, I mean, I'm in agriculture, food systems, climate change, and so on. So, they are, I mean, when I, when I talk with farmers, for example, particularly commodity growers, I can't talk about climate change. They instantly flip out because to them, climate change means government intervention and regulations, right? So if I talk to them about changing weather patterns that we need to adjust to and adapt to, now I got it because they realize that, yeah, no, it doesn't rain as often as it used to, but when it comes down, it comes down hard and causes problems. So how do you deal with this? So, so I'm, you know, we, we are putting the, the issue within to the context that the farmer experiences and doesn't feel threatened by. Now, on the contrary, feels, yeah, this is my topic. I want to talk about it. So, so to embed the information context specific you know, to the individual, uh, we, are, we, are, we are trying to help, to understand, to educate, inform. Yeah. Mm. If you'd hear from Pete in the last two minutes here. <laughs> I don't have much to say. Yeah, it's been a men's club today. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, well, you know, we can't help it, you know. <laughs> you know, I didn't choose to be an old white guy, you know, here I am. <laughs> actually, there are some systems which say actually you did have a choice, but we we'll, won't we'll go into that. <laughs> oh yeah, we, we, we won't get into that. Doctrine of karma stuff, you know. <laughs> um, it, it has been a really interesting conversation and um, we went through a lot of stuff. It, we, we all put a lot of stuff in the chat, so um, no notes in the Google Doc, which is fine. Uh, lots of cool stuff and, and links in the chat. Good time to wrap. I think it's a perfect time to wrap, yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you all. Good yeah, talk. Be well, See you next everybody. week, hopefully. Two weeks. Two weeks. Oh, two weeks. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. I, hope, two I weeks. hope it's two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good point. Got to read that next chapter. Right. See you guys. See Thanks you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Adios.